Let's have a moment of silence for Owen Wilson. Okay, we can't keep it too long because of YouTube algorithms. So here's the thing about this, man. Episode number four was amazing. Episode number four was awesome, which I'm so glad we got episode number four coming off of episode number three, because episode number three was boring, man. It was like the Empire Strikes Back version of Loki, right? It was just boring as hell. <laughs> so here's the thing about this, man. Like, I think... The story of Sylvie so far is interesting, but honestly, man, it, does her whole story really just boil down to a petty revenge story? Because if it is, that's the least interesting thing ever, right? Like from what I gather, just from what we've seen, right? Here's what we can kind of piece together, that she was a little girl and for whatever reason, the reason it was, was not given to her by Renslayer when she asked her in the elevator, what was my Nexus event? Renslayer's like, I don't really remember. We don't know what the Nexus event was, but we know that it was significant enough. The TVA snatched her up and they basically brought her into the TVA itself, which scared her. So she pickpocketed Renslayer, took her Tim pad, tried to go back to her universe, only to find it was wiped out. And then she's been on the run from the TVA ever since. And I guess that's it, right? It's just, you know, you hurt me, so I'm gonna hurt you back. Is that really all it is? Cause that's a pretty flimsy and kind of lame origin story. But regardless, Sylvie herself is cool. So I guess it makes up for it. But man, there were some mind blowing moments in this show. Okay, so here's the thing. As soon as Owen Wilson came out of that little portal thing with Loki and you saw Renslayer and those, those TVA guys standing there, I was like, all right, Owen Wilson, ain't making it. Owen Wilson's not gonna make it, son. <laughs> And then like the sad music started playing, you know, you know how it is, you know, the sad music starts playing and then it's like, oh my God, no, they're gonna kill Owen Wilson. And then sure enough, man, it's bow, they pruned him. And I felt so bad because I was like, no, Owen, I always wanted to see you on the jet ski, man. Like hopefully at the end we can see him on a jet ski, right? Just kind of living his best life or whatever it is. But it's so cool, man, because people are finally being woken up to what's actually going on. I like that it's all kind of falling apart. B-15 and Owen Wilson and all these people are starting to realize, okay, so like we really have been kidnapped by the, by the TVA, which leads me to believe I don't think they're all variants. Variants are people who deviate from the existing timeline and then in turn are brought into the TVA. But what was it that Owen Wilson was doing that he deviated from the timeline, right? I mean, seemingly the only way to deviate from the existing timeline is to have the ability to alter time, right? So if it's all a pre-guaranteed outcome, then what could Owen Wilson have possibly done? Did he stumble across a time machine, right? Did he stumble across Dr. Doom's time platform? Is his real name Owen Reese? I have no idea what, what the deal is with his character, right? But regardless of the situation, I don't think they're all variants. I think a lot of them are just innocent people who have just been snatched up by the TVA and just thrown in there and then just told, you've all always worked here and that's basically it. But regardless of the situation, it was amazing, man. Like, you know, when, when he came out and he died, it was like, wow, you know, it tugged at the heartstrings in, in the most powerful moment. The same thing with Loki, man. I never saw it coming with Loki getting pruned, not in a million years. I never, ever, ever saw that coming. And I will say this, you know, the more I look at Renslayer, the more I think she may not actually be a villain. She knows what she's supposed to do. She knows what her role is. And it almost seems like she's conflicted between her loyalty to the TVA and what her role describes and the hard decisions she has to make and like what's actually going on. But it could also be one of these things where she knows that they're not all created by the TVA. Like she knows that they're variants or whatever they want to call them, that like they all had lives before and they were snatched up and brought in there because she's the judge. Seemingly she's the highest ranking person outside of the, the, the timekeepers themselves. She knows what's going on. But at the end of the day, it's one of those things where it's like, but it's for the greater good. So like, yeah, it sucks that I have to do it, but I'll do it nonetheless. She doesn't strike me as a villain. She strikes me as a prick but she doesn't strike me as a villain. <laughs> <laughs> so in any event, I think it's kind of a, it's a, it's a wild thing, right? So let's talk about a few things here, right? The timekeepers and let's talk about that post credit scene. So here's the thing, the timekeepers, as soon as they walked into that room and you saw the timekeeper sitting there, I was like, oh my God, man, maybe it really isn't Miss Minutes, you know? Like maybe it really is a timekeepers are actually alive. Like they, they really are there and they do exist and they're overseeing all this stuff. I had to turn on, on subtitles, man. I could understand a damn thing those guys were saying, man. I was like, okay, let's turn on subtitles, find out what's going on here. Like, it was, a, it was a cool little cool little, little tidbit there. But like, as soon as one of them was decapitated and you found out it was a robot, I was like, Miss Minutes, man. Miss Minutes is the one behind it all. <laughs> That theory came right back. I don't, you know, honestly, here's the thing about theory crafting. I don't care if I'm right or wrong. I just like having fun with it. That's the, that's the important thing, guys. Just have fun. Don't focus on whether or not you're right or wrong. It doesn't really matter if you are. It's just a TV show, but it's, it's, it's a cool thing, right? It's a, it's a, a cool little thing here. So, so this post credit scene, right? This post credit scene is pretty wild because this really begs a lot of questions. One, it looks like they've been capturing Lokis for quite some time. Those are the only three that we saw, right? You saw Boastful Loki, 
Loki, who is most likely like Red Norvell or Loki from like Earth 691. I, he's one of those versions of Loki out there. Probably the one that just ended up becoming worthy of lifting Mjolnir and that's basically it. The hammer he has looks like it was built. So maybe it's just like that ultimate universe version of Loki that basically uses like the ultimate universe version of Thor's hammer. They don't look exactly the same. And in fact, that hammer looks starkly different from the one from the ultimate universe. But at the end of the day, that one looks like it was manufactured and the one in the ultimate universe was basically built in Marvel Comics. But regardless, you've also got Kid Loki. Kid Loki's cool, man. All right, so so at the time that I'm recording this video, on Comics Explained, I'm gonna have like a 20 minute long, 20 to 25 minute long explanation video on Kid Loki. But here's the quick little dirty breakdown of his character, right? So what you have was a story called Siege on Asgard. And the, the quick little explanation here is that Asgard was basically rebuilt in Broxton, Oklahoma by Thor after the events of Ragnarok when Thor and all the Asgardians and Asgard were destroyed when he basically destroyed the world tree. And so when Loki came back after taking over the body of Lady Sif and becoming Lady Loki, he basically believed that like Asgard was too good for humanity and it should exist in its own dimension. So he allied himself with Norman Osborn, who was a director of S.H.I.E.L.D., who basically rebranded S.H.I.E.L.D. into Hammer and then launched an attack on Asgard in the hopes that the Asgardians would say, okay, fine, Earth's too primitive, whatever, we're not staying here, we're gonna go back home again. The exact opposite happened. Instead, crazy things popped off, Asgard was totally destroyed and Loki was killed. Loki actually made a deal with Hela to have his name removed from the books of Hell, basically meaning that when he died, he would just be resurrected. And he came back in the form of Kid Loki, but with no memory of his own past. He had no idea who he was, didn't know that he was the god of mischief or anything like that. It was a complete and total clean slate. So that's kind of the origin of Kid Loki broken down in what, maybe like two minutes or something along those lines. <laughs> and then you got classic Loki, right? Who's played by Richard E. Grant. Classic Loki looks awesome. But what they basically tell Loki here is if you stay here, you're gonna die. Now, there's a few possibilities we can extrapolate here with what little we got. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few things we can extrapolate here. One, they're in the city of New York, right? So it's obviously an alternate Earth. And you can pick up a few things based on that. One, the giant skyline, and two, the Avengers Tower in the background, which is like leaning to one side. So maybe that's an alternate reality where the invasion of New York went off without a hitch. The whole world was conquered and just laid waste to. Maybe that's the world of like future King Loki, right? The one who obliterated all life on Earth in Marvel Comics. But regardless of the situation, they're basically in New York. The next thing is, I don't believe those are the only three Lokis who were there. I think there's more. I think there's more besides them, but like they're the ones who were just kind of there when he arrived. Now, did they know he was coming? Like, we don't really know, right? We don't really have that figured out. I mean, we don't know how long he was there before he woke up, right? Like maybe it was just one of those things of like, oh my God, a portal opened and a Loki fell out. All right, come on y'all, let's let's go get him, man. Like they sent him more of them over here. Let's go get him. Like they went to went to go find him and he was just he was just kind of laying there. So there's a few things that we don't really know, right? We don't have a time frame in terms of how long he's been there. The other thing is, why is it that if he stays there, that he's gonna die? The place looks like a post apocalyptic landscape, it looks derelict, right? Like there's not a whole lot there. I think it'd be awesome if it was the man God who was just like hunting Lokis across the world. The man God is amazing. Those of you guys who don't know what that is, man God was the result of what happened when Odin wiped out a whole civilization and the last remnants of that civilization channeled all their hatred and anger at Odin into a singular being. And then it became man God. When this guy shows up, even Odin his pants. It's a big deal, right? Like Odin is terrified of the man god. You cannot kill the man god. The best you can do is just hold him off or imprison him or something like that. But he's he's immortal and eternal. He cannot he cannot be killed. It's kind of a crazy thing, right? He's a, he's a nuts character. But I don't, I don't know what's leading to the deaths of all these different uh, these different Lokis, right? If he stays there, is he going to die? But that post credit scene looks awesome, man, because we see these very these different versions of Loki there. And that begs the question, why are they there? And my initial thought was, okay, so maybe it's one of these things where like Miss Minutes operating behind the scenes, timekeepers, whoever's in charge, they came to the realization somewhere along the line that every version of Loki out there will at some point in time develop the ability to travel beyond their existing universe and create alternate realities. And so they just wait until that version of Loki achieves that ability, then they snatch him up and they throw him in there. Which would kind of explain why it is that they waited until Loki had the cosmic cube and then broke the laws of his universe and then went back there. It could also be one of these things where Loki's genuinely immortal. Now here's the thing about immortality that we can kind of use from Marvel Comics and apply it to the MCU, although the Marvel Cinematic Universe might change it. In Marvel Comics, people oftentimes confuse immortality with invulnerability. Immortality in Marvel Comics basically just means you'll never die of old age and you'll never die of disease. And that's it, right? Everything else is just a complement to immortality. So you could come across somebody who's immortal and you could chop their head off, assuming the weapon you had was of sufficient strength. So long as their head stays separated from their body, they'll never be able to come back. But the important thing here is 
is that invulnerability is in and of itself, as you guys would expect, the inability or the exceedingly high difficulty level that comes with injuring someone. So if you have an insane level of durability, and you're immortal, well then you're basically a demigod. Like a really good example of a person who is immortal and then also has exceedingly high levels of invulnerability is a villain like Apocalypse, right? Like he is inherently immortal. That's his That's his power, right? He's, he's a mutant who is legitimately immortal. That makes him something called an external, a legitimately immortal mutant that will never die of old age or disease. But somebody of sufficient power could kill Apocalypse. And the reason why is because while he's not inherently invulnerable and didn't have high levels of invulnerability in Marvel Comics, he eventually made a deal with the Celestials, the beings that you're gonna see in the Eternals film. He made a deal with them to borrow some of their technology, which grants him high levels of invulnerability. That's why it's so hard to kill him. So I thought that immortality thing kind of needed to be fleshed out a little bit. It could be that in the Marvel Cinematic Universe that Loki's just legitimately immortal, right? Every time he dies, he comes back as somebody else, right? It just, it always repeats itself. He just always comes back. But the biggest issue that you have is why the TV is snatching up these versions of Loki. Why they're grabbing so many of them and then seemingly pruning them or dropping them off, right? I mean, it'd be one of these things that they brought them in and they, they tried to make them all TVA agents and they defected and then in turn, they just dropped them off there. I imagine they were all pruned for different reasons. I mean, Sylvie was kind of on the run and maybe that's maybe that was the process, right? Maybe that was the idea that Sylvie was an example, right? An instance whereby Lokis are not supposed to exist. Lokis are not supposed to be there, but if Lokis are not supposed to exist, why wasn't Loki snatched up earlier? Like the instant he was born. Why was, it, why was it that Loki was not snatched up as a little kid, right? In the same way that Sylvie was and then taken to the TVA. So there's a lot of possibilities here, right? Like a lot of things that could happen. That's one of the big struggles that you have when you're talking about like a 30 second post credit scene is what do you do with it, right? Like what do you what do you do with this little bit of information? So anyway, guys, uh, thank you all for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode as much as I did and I will catch you all later. Peace.